PEE can be helpful or harmful, but how do we distinguish when it's safe from when it's not safe? Find out right now in episode three of Tea Time. Welcome to Tea Time. I'm Dr. Plakis, and today we're going to talk about when not to use TEE. Before we get started, I wanted to give a quick shout out. The intro music and exit music you hear is the instrumental to the song Soul Shine by Jessica Mack, who is my wife. She's a singer songwriter. Feel free to check out her music on Apple Music or Spotify, wherever you listen. The clinical question that we're going to address is in which perioperative scenarios should a practitioner avoid the use of TEE? And what strategies can we use to reduce the risk of TEE placement and use in higher risk patients? There are a lot of known risks to TEE placement and use, some of them minor and some of them major. And that's one of the main first parts of this episode today is what are TEE contraindications? When you look at TEE contraindications, you'll find a lot of variability as far as what are the absolute contraindications and what are the relative contraindications. The two main sources we find this information are in the 2010 ASA SCA guidelines and the 2013 ASC guidelines for performing a comprehensive TEE exam. There's a lot of information here, but basically what this tells us is in the 2010 ASA guidelines, the members could not agree on if there were absolute contraindications to TEE or not besides esophagectomy. Some of the people did agree that there were esophageal strictures, TE fistulas, post-esophageal surgery and esophageal trauma could be listed as absolute contraindications. However, if you look further down in the 2013 ASC guidelines, you'll see esophageal stricture, tumor, active upper GI bleed, esophageal diverticulum that are slightly different, and you'll also see a number of relative contraindications. Here's another way to look at the contraindications. It's a long list, and it actually gives explanations of why each one is concerning in its own way. Feel free to take a screenshot of this page, as it may be a helpful reference item later down the road if you encounter any of these problems. However, it doesn't tell us the magnitude of the problem, what to do about it. If anything, I need more help delineating what do I do with these problems, where do I go from here. That's why I created my own system for evaluating the safety of TE Pro placement, and I put it in an acronym for TE probe, P-R-O-B-E, and we'll look at each one of these items and why you need to look at it before placing a TEE. So in the word probe, the P stands for patent. That's the first question I ask. If I place a TEE probe in the esophagus and stomach, what do I believe they're patent or are there any obstructive features that I'd be concerned that the TEE probe would cause harm or be unable to pass through? The next letter R stands for robust. Are the tissues robust and supportive for safe TEE probe placement and passage? Certain things you look at here are, do the patient have a history of radiation, prior surgery? Is the tissue robust? The O stands for other. And this just encourages us to look at many things outside of the esophagus and the GI tract. The B stands for bleeding. Are there any features that the patient has that increases their risk for bleeding with TEE probe placement? prior bleeds, or susceptibility to bleeding. And the last letter E stands for explore. Sometimes you're not going to know the answer, so we need to explore further. This is where you take a more thorough history, look at imaging, and consider consulting GI for EGD placement or just for evaluation or discussion. So the helpful saying is evaluate the patient before placing the TEE probe, P-R-O-B-E. There are also certain ways that when we have evaluated a patient that we can reduce the risk if we're concerned about the TEE probe placement. This is a long, busy slide, and it's meant to be a screenshot. So feel free to take a screenshot of this, and we're going to reference each one of these points individually. The first way to reduce the risk of TE probe use is to ask the question, should we even be doing it? Sometimes there's other, safer options that we need to consider. Would you use transthoracic echocardiography, epicardial or epiaortic imaging? Would you use ice in certain clinical scenarios? Or would you use a smaller or a pediatric TE probe? There's a lot more you can do before the procedure to get more information about the safety of the patient and the pathology they have. A thorough evaluation is always important. Ask them about dysphagia to pills, to food, to secretions. A lot of this can delineate minor problems to major problems. Ask about their surgical history and look for any old EGD notes. I'm gonna harp on this a couple of times, but I think a GI consultation and considering a pre-TEE EGD is a major tool to have in your back pocket. 
There's steps that we can take during TE probe insertion and manipulation that can help limit the risk to the patient. During insertion, use extra lubricant. It's so easy and a simple way to reduce the risk of the TE probe being caught on something that it normally might slip through. Also, stop if resistance is encountered. If there's one thing you take away from this presentation, stop. If you've tried two, three times and you keep encountering resistance, we need to get extra help. If you're still having trouble with inserting the probe past the upper esophageal sphincter, using direct visualization with a laryngoscope is important. And you can either use a long Miller blade for this or a video laryngoscope. Now, during the actual exam, it's important to limit any unnecessary duration or manipulation of the probe that could cause the patient harm. Only image what you have to image. Avoid excessive anaflexion, retroflexion. Avoid keeping the probe in locked positions for prolonged periods of time. Also, for the sake of completeness, freeze your images when the TE probe is not in use and minimize high energy views like 3D as these can all increase the temperature of the TE probe. Finally, if this is a very high risk patient, only the most experienced operator should perform the procedure. This is not one for trainees or the least experienced in the room. When you're done with the exam, there's a couple things to look for in the high risk patients. Remove the TEE probe and look at the end to see if there's any blood upon removal, as this may be an early sign of an upper GI bleed that may warrant further consultation. Also, postoperatively, if the patient has any signs or symptoms of vomiting, chest pain, subcutaneous emphysema, hematemesis, urgent evaluation by a GI doctor is indicated. Now, there's some specific pathology that I want us to walk through to learn the process about thinking through this and applying it to each of these disease processes. I want to give a lot of credit to Dr. Kelly Mishra, who's a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, who shared this information with me a few years back. Let's start with esophageal varices. Keep in mind, when you see this chart, I don't hold to this chart as the gold standard, but more loosely as a guidance and a framework for how to think through each of these diseases. When you look at esophageal varices and think about the PROBE acronym, this patient would be a B because they're a bleeding risk. A couple things about varices you want to ask are how big are they? Have they had prior procedures on them? And then there's a couple of steps you can take, such as minimizing your lower esophageal views and maintaining the probe in the upper two-thirds of the esophagus where varices tend not to be. Next, let's think about upper GI bleeding. Was it esophageal? Was it gastric? Because the TE probe could stay in the esophagus the whole time. Also, was it very recent? And was there a follow-up EGD? Or has it been stable and old for a long time? All those factors come into play as far as where you place the probe and where it would be safest. Esophageal strictures or stents are another major factor when evaluating the safety of TE probe placement. With strictures, the question I ask myself is, is the esophagus patent, the P in TE probe? Certain questions you can ask yourself are, has the patient had significant dysphagia? Are they tolerating secretions or certain foods? Have they ever required a G-tube because of the problems they've had? Or have they ever had an esophagram that can help determine lumen patency? If they've ever had an esophageal stent, that's a major concern that I would talk to the GI physician about. I think it's worth noting, in patients who present with dysphagia, that necessitates a workup if it's not been done already. And it's very important to distinguish between oropharyngeal dysphagia, which can occur after strokes, from esophageal dysphagia, which points to mechanical obstructions. When thinking about esophagitis or peptic ulcer disease, I want to know the severity of it. The tissue is weaker when it's severely inflamed, and it's also a higher bleeding risk. Was it recent or was it a long time ago? What's the grade of the esophagitis? Also, with hiatal hernias, it can make advancement of the TE probe difficult, so don't push the probe too hard on these patients. Another factor is neck or mediastinal radiation or neck immobility due to unstable cervical spines. Chest radiation is a major factor for weak tissue, so I would ask how recent was the chest radiation? Do you have active symptoms from it like dysphagia or active esophagitis? Also, with cervical spine problems, Neck manipulation is very common with placement of these probes, and it's important to know if that cervical spine has been cleared or if it's uncleared or unstable, and you could put the patient at significant risk of neurologic injury during TE probe placement. All these problems group into prior surgeries on the stomach or esophagus. It's important to note that in esophagectomy patients, these patients are some of the highest risk and do require clearance from a thoracic surgeon or a GI physician. It's also worth noting that prior esophagectomy patients frequently have very poor views as the conduit could be in the right side of the chest and not afford good views of the heart. When thinking about prior gastric surgery, such as a Nissen fund application or bariatric surgery, the big question I ask myself is, do I feel like the esophageal and gastric lumen are patent? And is it long enough from surgery that I feel like it is adequately healed and I'm not risk of perforation? As far as other esophageal pathologies, such as prior perforated esophagus, esophageal tumors, unrepaired diverticulum, 
These are all very concerning to me, both for esophageal patency and also because the tissues may be weak and may make it easier for an esophageal rupture. The key takeaways in this episode are evaluate first before insertion using the acronym TE probe. That's another way to think about it instead of sifting through all the absolute and relative contraindications to TE probe placement. When in doubt, call GI, have their number on speed dial. They are tremendously helpful at advising and even scoping to determine the safety of TE probe placement. And when able, take steps to lower risk. Those include alternative options, pre-procedure assessments, certain steps you can take during insertion or probe manipulation, and having a level of suspicion after removal for any residual problem. So at this point, we've gone over the indications, the contraindications to TE probe placement. Now next episode, we're going to talk about proper TE probe insertion and troubleshooting a difficult insertion. Thank you guys for watching. Now, if you like this content and want more of it, please consider subscribing and leaving a five-star review as that really helps us reach more people with this content. We'll see you guys next time.